Ding, ding. Ah, oh, it's a thrill to be back. It's, um, I think, five years since I was here. And I've done millions of miles since then. I'm going to talk to you tonight about your evolution. It's probably not the way you see it. But I'm really into the shortcut, you know? All this bullshit of going up a fucking mountain in the Hindu Kush. Forget it. It takes too long. I like to helicopter in, talk to the guy and leave, you know? No pissing about. Because we live in a fast-moving world. And I'm not mad keen on things that are complicated because, I don't know, I've always liked spirituality to be very simple and easy. And all spirituality in the end is to do with freedom. Because you don't get freedom for nothing. And you don't get meaning for nothing. Our societies are not designed to set you free. They don't say, now let's have lots and lots of laws that allow all these lovely Danish people to be free. To be individuals, to fall in love, to make as much money as they want, to go where they want, when they want. We don't have countries like that. Our countries are run by the biggest assholes that have ever incarnated on this planet. And they're basically into control trips. And we are programmed to conform, you know? And sitting at the hotel today having lunch, watching people walk back and forth, I was watching them and thinking, wow, how sad. Because they have sort of like conformist walks, you know, they have a special conforming way of walking. And um, to really conform, you have to press the muscles of your ass like this, you know, because you have to hold this sort of invisible etheric carrot up your ass. So... I was having this very expensive lunch, and you watch them doing conforming when they're walking. There's an actual conformist walk, and it's a bit sort of, it's a bit like that. And then they come to this traffic light, and they're not allowed to cross for some reason that I cannot fucking understand if the little man is red, you know? So they all stand there, I presume, in the pissing rain, waiting for the light to go green, you know? And I think, wow, that is so amazing. I mean, why would they do that? You know, imagine when it's colder, which is like, what, most of the time, right? You know, you look up the road, there's no cars coming. You look up the road the other way, you can see the fucking Stockholm. There's not a single car on the road, right? <laughs> and there's six people at the traffic light standing there in the pissing rain. And you think, huh? Excuse me? Why are they doing it? You know, why are they doing it? And I thought, how weird, you know? So I saw the little red man. I thought, this is perfect. So I walked across, you know? And I thought, wow, if you could just teach people to walk when the little red man comes instead of the green man, you could already liberate people enormously, you know? In fact, if you get to the traffic light and you see the little green guy, don't cross. Wait for the red guy, okay? <laughs> then take one or two people's hands and say, here, let's be brave and cross the fucking street when the red guy's on, you know? It's so bizarre. I mean, when you look at it, it's ridiculous. And they're walking along going, we're very sweet people. Ding, ding, ding. We're Danish. Ding, ding, ding. And here comes a little red sign. And now we're going to stand in the pissing rain and wait. When there's no traffic. Now, okay, I can imagine if there's 25 trucks and buses going past, the red guy's a good idea. But if there's nobody on the fucking road for miles, it's mad. You know? And you think, well, how did all these very brave people, you know, these... Vikings, these incredible warriors, get to the point where they completely lost the fucking plot. And they sit there like a bunch of arseholes at the traffic light, you know? It's ridiculous. But it's no different in any other country, you know? Because, I mean, have you ever been to California recently? I mean, I tell you, California is about as arseholic as you can get. They're so serious. They're so serious. They literally have got these invisible carrots up their ass, you know? And they're really, and they're rushing around, and you can't smoke in California. If you want a cigarette, you have to go to Arizona, you know? <laughs> There's no place in California you can have a smoke. So I go in this club, and I know it's non-smoking. And I'm with some friends, so I say, let's smoke. They say, well, no, this is California, you know, you're not allowed to smoke the federal regulations, so you're not allowed to smoke, you must have... I said, fuck the federal regulations, let's have a cigarette. 
So we all lit up a cigarette. So they come along, sure. You know, excuse me. You know, I'd smoke. I say, well, I'm only smoking this cigarette. They say, no, no, you're not even allowed to smoke this cigarette. I said, look, brother, you know, I want to smoke a cigarette. What are you going to do about it? He said, well, you know, we can call the police. We can have you arrested. I said, fine. But by the time they come, I will have finished the fucking cigarette. <laughs> so what the fuck are you going to do about it, brother? You know? So they're getting really upset with you, you know? Then the manager comes and says, you've got to leave the club. I said, okay, as soon as I finish the cigarette, I'll go. No problem. And I thought, wow, this is so much fun. So California actually has a wonderful spiritual lesson because there are so many rules in California that you can become, you can test your power. Do you follow me? Because that's really what you've got to do out there. You've got to test the system, whether it's the system of religions, the systems of morality, the systems of sexuality, the systems of God, the political system, the tax system, you know? The tax system, for fuck's sake, man. Let me help you practice the tax system. This is how you handle the tax system. <laughs> like that. Excuse me? Try this. Fuck the tax system, man. You know? People ask me for taxes. I say, fuck off. It's my money. They say, but you've got to pay. I say, I'm giving you a fucking thing. So fuck off. What are you going to do about it? You know? Piss off. You've got to fight for your freedom. You have to. Because this is a fascist world and it's getting worse, isn't it? You know, with the, U the European Union. I think they want you to join the euro now, you know? You've got very nice little krona, very pretty pictures on it. And they want you to go into the euro. For fuck's sake, have you seen what's been happening to the euro? The euro needs a parachute to survive. It is falling so fast, you know? And they want you to join. And they're going to have a scare stories in the paper for six months, I'm sure. Why? Because the last referendum you had when you said, listen, fuck the euro... They didn't like it, right? Because it doesn't allow you to drift into the conformity of the new world order. And now they're going to tell you you want to join the euro. I tell you, if you vote for the euro, you're stupid. Because suddenly you have no more power. There'll be some arsehole in Belgium telling you what you can do and what can't do. It's stupid, isn't it? But we're born to this conformity. And if you don't conform, it's very scary. I was going from Vancouver, B.C., in, in Western Canada to America. And I was going through the customs... And one of these customs officers came up to me with one of those little dogs that sniffs your luggage, you know? So the dog's sniffing my luggage, and he's putting this sort of dog snot all over my luggage, right? <laughs> and my luggage is not so expensive. It's not like it's Louis Vuitton or anything like that. But even so, I did not wake up in his life thinking, I need fucking dog snot on my luggage, <laughs> you know? So I said to this little dog, fuck off and leave me alone. And a customs officer said to me, excuse me, he said, but I'm a government official and you cannot tell me to fuck off because I can arrest you. And I said to him, listen, excuse me, but I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to the dog, <laughs> right? Now, please inform me if the dog is a government official or not. Because if the dog's in a government official, I'm happy to apologize because I've had a rather tiring day. But if it's not a government official... You know, anyway, in the meantime, the dog pissed off and went somewhere else. But it's mad, isn't it? That they allow this dog to slobber all over your luggage. For goodness sake. It'd be like having a kangaroo that just hopped in. You know, you go to Australia, this kangaroo hops into the customs hall, pisses all over your luggage and hops back out again. Hey, g'day, mate. Welcome to Australia, mate. You say, excuse me, your kangaroo just pissed on my fucking suitcase, man. But we're supposed to sit there and go, oh, this is fine. You know? Can you imagine Olympic Games when they got like 500 government kangaroos to piss all over everybody? <laughs> what is this? The Olympic Games, man. We're pissing on your luggage. The point is that spirituality is not automatic. And even our modern spirituality does, is not designed to set you free. If you've ever joined any of those Hindu religions, you know, there's thousands of rules. You know, if you're Jewish, there's a thousand rules, isn't there? 666, I don't know, there's millions of fucking rules. Millions of them, you know. You, you incarnate and think, wow, I think I'll be Jewish. Look at this, there's 600 bloody rules we've got to go past. And the Hindus are the worst. They've got millions of bloody rules. And even when you're making love, there's a bunch of rules, right? You can't just have a shag and have a good time, you know? That Kundalini's got to go this way, it's got to go that way, you've got to hum and ah, it's going to be three in the morning, you've got to hang off the chandelier, talk to Krishna. What the fuck? I'm just trying to have a bunk with my husband. Will you give me a break, will you now, will you? No, 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 there's got to be rules. And Christianity, you know, look at the rules in Christianity. For fuck's sake, Christianity's hopeless, you know? Like, my mother was a Catholic, and she had to sign a piece of paper saying that she would raise me as a Catholic, you know, like this. Well, of course, I'm the least Catholic person in the world. 
But of course, when I was like one, I couldn't argue, you know, because I didn't know any better. But later on, I could argue, you know. And Catholicism is a very funny religion because it's built on fear and it's built on guilt and lots of other things that you probably don't need, right? Like long books about the Jews. I never figured out what the fuck that had to do with me because I wasn't Jewish. I was born in Africa. Well, I was born in England, but I was raised in Africa. And I thought, what is all this history of the Jews to do with me, for goodness sake, you know? I mean, I've got nothing against the Jews, but it's like saying, well, listen, we're going to, you know, study the history of the Azerbaijanis. You think, what the fuck for? You know, unless I'm going to Azerbaijan, why would I care, you know? But anyway, I did years of this crap. All these apostles and these tribes and the wars they got into. Anyway, finally, I began to understand Catholicism. I thought, this is really strange stuff, man, you know? And in Catholicism, you can go to hell for more or less anything, right? I mean, for even looking up, you can go to hell, you know? I mean, they've got hell worked out, the Catholics, right? In fact, being a Catholic, it's almost impossible to go to heaven. Because if you make one fuck up in the whole of your life, you know? Let's say one morning you're a bit stoned, you don't get to mass, you don't get to heaven. So, in fact, there are actually no Catholics in heaven, right? <laughs> They've done an audit. Uh, Price Waterhouse, you know, famous accounting company, have done an audit of how many Catholics are actually in fucking heaven. None. Zip. Not a one. Because every one of them fucked up somewhere in the course of 80 years. You're bound to, aren't you, you know? And of course, if you're Catholic, you're not allowed to masturbate. Right? So, I mean, imagine how many people that's fucked up for a start, you know? <laughs> and of course, they all go around terribly guilty because they know they're going to hell, you know? And I thought about this. So when I got to puberty... At the age of 13, I thought to myself, well, this masturbation thing's a bit hard because I was living at that time in this sort of English prison that they call public schools with like 500 other boys. And now I'm 13 and I've got all this testosterone running around my body and like, it's almost like I've got my, you know, testicles for earrings, you know. And I'm thinking, women, women, where are they? And there's not one in sight. But you're not allowed to masturbate. So you think, well, what the fuck am I going to do, man? I'm going to padlock my hands to the bed or what, you know? And I thought, this is so weird. This religion's totally fucking out of, the, out of his head. And I thought about it for days and days and days. And I thought, well, wait a minute. If God really, 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 really was really upset about you masturbating, you know? I mean, really upset. Your thingy would be out of reach, wouldn't it? It'd be somewhere strange, like on the back of your leg or something, you know? So down here. You know, and you'd be going like this, and they'd be going, I know what you're doing. You're going, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I know. But you imagine God up there thinking, right, we're not going to let any of these people masturbate. We're going to put 10 trillion testosterones flying around their body, right? But we're not going to let them do anything about it. That should work. That should really fuck them up, you know? Really mess them around a bit, you know? So they've totally gone cross-eyed, you know? So I looked at this stuff, and I thought, wait a minute, I want to be free. Fuck the Catholics, man. You know, and fuck this masturbation bollocks and fuck the rules. I want out, you know, I want out. So I went, um, well, I went on a very strange and interesting path. I mean, some people would be shocked on the path I went on. Because I basically went out on the streets, you know, and lived my life out there, you know. I don't mean as a homeless person, because I made money from the day that I saw a five pound note. But to become free, it's so liberating. It's so glorious. It's part of how you reach the infinite self. You know, the whole point of the infinite self is it's infinite. The whole point of God is that God is unjudgmental and infinite. The whole point of this journey is that you realize that you're not a physical body. You're not a Jew. You're not a Catholic. You're not an African. You're not a Hindu. You're an eternal body, eternal spirit that's rented a body. It's basically you've gone to Avis, Hertz, rent a car and said, give me one. You know, and they say, what kind do you want? You say, well, I want a fucked up one that has no legs. And they say, oh, we've got one here, have this one. You know, or you say, yes, actually, I want to look like, you know, Cindy Crawford. You say, perfect, I'll have that one. I mean, that's the story here. We're trying to become free. But our societies are run by these complete assholes that don't want us to be free. Why? Because they need our money. They need the power trip over us. They need to be able to control us to feel big time and safe and important. But have you ever met a government official that was really important? I've never, I never have. You know, I never have, man. I promise you, I never have. They're all totally arseholic to me. You know, I mean, some of them are quite sweet. But they're sweet like a sort of rainy afternoon is sweet, you know? 
You're watching the water run down the window thinking, when the fuck's the rain going to stop? You know? We're not born to be free. And we're not born to have meaning. Because our society is designed to make sure that you don't have any meaning. That you just tick-tock along, giving your money to them, so that they have meaning. That's it. Real meaning, you have to fight for it. Real meaning is something you have to discover inside yourself. Now, you may discover real meaning through marriage, love, romance, children, family. You may find real meaning in your spiritual path in life, or you may find real meaning helping people, but you have to discover it. Otherwise, life is incredibly boring, isn't it? And when you turn the television on, it's ridiculous. It's just basically a propaganda tool for TikTok, isn't it? You know? It tells you, conform. Buy these type of fish fingers and not those. You know, these tampons, not those. Buy this shit. And what do they have on television? They have the, whatever the government's telling you. Hello, everybody in Denmark, you sweet and lovely drones. Listen to tonight's news. This is what the government is saying today. These are the things that we want you to buy. These are the things and concepts we want you to accept. This is the bullshit. Don't think for yourself, please. We don't want any of that original thinking crap going down, down here. You know, just buy this bullshit. You know, and by the way, when you get to the traffic light, remember the little red guy and turn uh, across the fucking road. And you might think to yourself, wow, this is so sad. Well, what happened to the spirit of the Vikings, brothers? You know, what happened to this powerful nation, you know? I mean, don't feel bad about it. I'm not putting you down because it's the same in every bloody nation, you know? Because you've only got to go to England to see what a bunch of assholes they are, you know? It's a very short trip, you know? Or try Germany, you know? For some reason, all the fascists in the world seem to have incarnated in Germany and all the arseholes in England. <laughs> it's really amazing. Totally amazing, you know? So it's not that one particular nation's any worse or any better, but you think to yourself, why, my God, look at these proud people, you know? And how do they fall so low, fall so low you know? And how did we all fall so low? It's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. So when I started to look at this stuff from a point of spirituality, I thought, well, what would God want? And of course, God doesn't want anything. God's love, immensity, enormity. I've seen it. You know the near-death tube that people see when they have these traumas in surgery? And they see the light of God, you know? And then some spirit comes along, you know, like Jesus, and says to them, not yet. And they realize, oh, fuck, okay, back to the earth plane, right? Not yet. Well, I've seen that seven times. I didn't die on a surgery table. I just learned this trick in trance. So I could trance myself so much that I simulated death. And I've seen the light of the God Force. And it's immense. It's huge. It has no boundaries. It has no rules. You know, there are no tax forms. There are no regulations of what shape the fucking cheese is supposed to be up there in the God Force. There's no little guys with little red lights that say cross or don't cross. It's big. It's you. It's me. It is the infinite self. And the first concept in that book, Infinite Self, is I am God. And people say, wow, that's really arrogant. What do you mean I am God? Well, I am God. Ding, ding. Wake up. I'm God. Okay? Ding, ding. You're God. And so are you. And so are you. And so are you, sir. We're all bloody God. There is no God outside us. And whatever else there is in, in the team, you know? In other dimensions, other planets, wherever they are. But we are God. So next time the tax man comes out and says, have you filed your taxes? You say, I'm God, fuck off. Ding, ding, wake up. Yeah, if you think the way I do, people think you're a radical, an anarchist, dangerous. Deepak goes around and says, Oh, Stuart Wilde is very dangerous. <laughs> very, very dangerous. And I said to him, Excuse me, Deepak, I'm not so very, very dangerous. I'm just an anarchist, man. A spiritual anarchist. Why? Because I want everybody to be free. You know, I want to let them out of prison. You know, I want them to look at all those little vitamin bottles in the morning and say, fuck this shit and have a vodka and tonic instead. <laughs> you know? 
If you're vegetarian, do me a favor tonight. Go to McDonald's. <laughs> Have a double cheeseburger with all the shit on it, right? The worst crap you've ever seen. Tomato ketchup, the lot. And you'll liberate yourself. You can go back to vegetarianism tomorrow. But don't make it into a religion for Christ's sake, you know? And it's a mad world that we live in. This is the world that we're supposed to be living in. And of course, the whole of it is the journey towards liberation. So I started off my spiritual journey as a teacher, teaching people how to get out of TikTok. It's what I call this nine to five nonsense, you know? And so I'd say to them, listen, be brave. Be brave. Try it at the traffic lights. Grab three or four people's strangers' hands. That even when you touch them, they'll be shocked, right? They go, ah! I'm being abducted. No, 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 you're not being abducted. I'm showing you something, brother. You know? Here, hold my hand. We're going to be brave. We're going to walk across this red light. They said, fucking hell, man, we can't do that. You say, sure we can. Be brave. Fight for your freedoms. And if the coppers stop you, if the police stop you and try to arrest you for walking against the light, tell them you're a Polish refugee. <laughs> say, sorry, I'm a Polish refugee. And the policeman says, well, what do you mean there's Polish refugee? They don't have refugees in Poland. You're saying, well, no, of course, because I left. You know, I'm here. <laughs> and he says, well, how many Polish refugees are there? You say, I don't know, but I know at least one. Me. I didn't understand this red thing. He says, and he'll say to you, listen, you've got to stop when it's red, you know. You say, well, I've got to tell you the truth. I lied. And the policeman says, what do you mean you lied? You say, well, I'm not really a Polish refugee. I come from Chechnya. He says, what are, you, what, what are you telling me now? You say, you're not, you're, not, you're not Danish, you're not a Polish refugee, and you come from Chechnya. You say, yeah, well, that's the whole point of being a refugee. You keep moving, man, you know. <laughs> if you stay in the same place, you can't be a fucking refugee. You fail, you know. Well, now, Chechnya, brother, you say to him. Chechnya, have you ever been there, brother? And he'll say to you more than likely, no, I don't even know where bloody Chechnya is. You say, well, it's in Russia, you know. We've been having a war in there. You know, the Russian troops came in and they bombed the shit out of the place, man, you know. And that's why I crossed on the little red guy. And the policeman's going, excuse me, you crossed on the little red guy because there's a war in Chechnya. You say, yeah, because, you know, in Chechnya, man, the bombs are falling in the street all day long, you know. My father was killed, my mother was killed, my brother was killed crossing the road. Even the fucking cat was killed crossing the road, you know. So in Chechnya, you can't piss around waiting for a little red guy, green guy, that kind of shit. If you're crossing the road in Chechnya, you've got to go really quick, man, you know. So the guy will go, oh, fuck, all right, all right, off you go, off you go, don't worry about it, okay. She's a Chechnyan, Polish, Danish, something refugee. Then you go around the corner, right, and you find some people that are the green one and the red one. You say, wait, don't cross on the green. Wait for me. We'll all go together on the red. Okay? And this is how to make it really successful experiment. Put your finger up. <laughs> and walk on the red. Ding, ding, let's go. Ding, ding, let's go. Try this. Go into a restaurant. And order everything backwards. The whole lot. So start with a coffee, dessert, main dish, starter, soup, and a cocktail. It drives them fucking crazy. They say, what kind of anarchist is this that wants the bloody dessert first? The other thing you can do, which I love to do, but I've only done it a few times because it's expensive, is, you know the long list of starters in a menu on the first page, you know? When the waiter comes or the waitress comes and says, which starter would you like? You pause and go, hmm. They say, well, which would you like? You say, all of them. They go, excuse me? I did this in a Thai restaurant in Perth in Western Australia. All of them? They said, but there's 22 starters on here. I said, I oh, know, all of them. Give me the lot. They said, you can't eat 22 starters. And I said to the waitress, I said, look, sweet pea, I said, I didn't say I was going to eat them. I want to look at them. <laughs> she says, but you'll have to pay for them. I said, look, I'm not arguing about that. Of course I'll have to pay for them. I said, just give me all the bloody starters. So she gets in a panic and runs off and speaks to the manager and says, look, I think my English isn't very good. There's a bloke over here that wants all the starters, all 22 of them, you know, pad, sod, prick, dom, dick, you know, that stuff they have in time. <laughs> in Thai restaurants, all 22 of them. So the manager is very polite, comes up to me and says, excuse me, sir, Mr. Wan. He said, um, she hasn't understood. You want all 22 stars? I said, I said, yeah, it's a lot. He says, well, that's a lot of food. I said, I know, I explained to her, I just want to look at them. And if there's any dishes I like the look of, I'll eat some. 
So they bought all 22 starters. It's really cool. But now here's the best bit. Then they come along and say, what do you want for a main dish? <laughs> There's 60 main dishes. 60. Lamb, this, beef. I mean, I don't eat meat, but, you know, all this shit, you know, done every which way. You can have it in a basket. You can have it in a little boat. You can have the king of fucking Siam paddle past if you want, you know? What do you want? I said all of them. Every single fucking one of them. The manager freaked out. Completely freaked out. And then he put his foot down. He said, you can't have all of them. The kitchen will go crazy, you know? I said, okay, I said, give me 20, 25, 30. What's our deal here? He said, you can have 20. Which ones do you want? I said, I don't know. I'm not from Thailand. You pick them. So they bought 20 main dishes. And then right at the end, when we really want to make it hurt, we got to the desserts. And he came up and said, do you want the dessert menu? I said, yep. He said, what would you like? I said, how many guesses do you want? <laughs> All of them. That was a great night out. I can't remember how much it cost, but it was fun. Because it's this idea of like, why should you be limited when you go to a restaurant? You know? Why should you be limited when you go into a bar? Why should you be limited when you make love? Why should you be limited when you talk to God? Why should you be limited when you earn money? Why should you be limited on your quest in life? Why should you be limited on anything, providing you're not hurting people? You know? You are born free. Definitely. There's no question of it. I will give you my personal written guarantee. This whole of my teaching life can be bullshit. But there's one thing that's definite, is you're free. And you start to become free. And you look at the infinity inside of you and you just align to it. You are your own sovereign nation. I know people in America who've worked out a way of becoming sovereign people, meaning that they're not part of American tax law. <laughs> There's a, a quirky thing in American law where if you're a citizen of the United States, you owe, you owe taxes to the Inland Revenue Service. But if you are an American, you don't. In other words, the tax law in America was written for the citizens of the United States. If you elect to be an American person, there is no tax law in America. So these characters figured out it's much cheaper to be American than a citizen of the United States. Because as a citizen of the United States, you pay taxes, and as an American, you don't. So they just decided to be Americans. Then they realized there was lots of other little loopholes, like they could issue driver's licenses. United Nations driver's licenses. They don't even need American driver's licenses. You can have a United Nations one. And you don't even have it into, into your own name. Do you want to be a count, countess, princess, king? You know, do you want to be Muhammad Ali, Michael Jackson? Who do you fancy? You can have a United Nations driver's license in any name you like. It's legal. I thought, fantastic. For weeks now, I've been thinking, what shall I call myself? <laughs> you know, what, what will I have? And it says occupation. I'm going to put diplomat. That way, when you arrive at the customs, they'll see United Nations diplomat. They must think, woo, tick-tock, let him through. You know? And that little dog that sniffs and pisses all over your suitcase has got to go fuck off somewhere else, you know? There's ways around everything. One way around is to move. Because if you keep moving, you're free. You know, like a shark will die if it doesn't stop moving. A shark in the sea. It has to move to take in oxygen to stay alive. And I thought about it. I thought, wow, my incarnation as a shark. Because if you keep moving, you're safe. But we tend to think that if we do move a lot, we become unsafe. But the most unsafe place to be is in the same place, isn't it? If you keep moving, you're safe. So that's why years and years and years and years and years ago, I thought, wow, I'll keep moving. And a lot of the time, I move all the time. Like, often I move every three days. Ding, ding, let's go. I think I've been in nine cities in six days. Ding, ding, let's go. But that, in a way, is how our spirituality is. Our spirituality is moving. Our energy is moving. Our power is moving. It isn't a sedentary thing. A sitting down, slow, nauseating thing. We're climbing. And at first, you have to fight your way out. You have to fight your way out of the morass of TikTok. And it's really hard to let go. It's really hard to leave. 
I remember thinking when I left Catholicism, my God, I'm going to burn in hell. And then I thought, well, fuck this, man. I'm going to burn a boredom if I don't leave. But if you look at this, your journey's like this. This is the infinite journey. You start here. TikTok. Total nonsense. No freedom. The mother-in-law comes around. You've got to eat the stupid cake. You hate the cake. You hate her, but you can't look her in the eye and say, listen, look, I really love you, but fuck off. I don't want the cake. Try it on Sunday next time she comes around. Fuck off. I don't want the cake. You know? Because we're scared to do that. You need somebody to train you to do that. You know? To train you to look the world in the eye and say, listen, please don't take it personally, but piss off. <laughs> the other night I was in a club. I work at night a lot. I work at night a whole bunch because I go out with these little wizards that I train. And we go and save souls at night. And I was in this club and there was a fight. Well, there wasn't a fight till I got there, but I helped it along a bit. <laughs> and this guy says, I'm calling the police. I said, all right, call him. He said, you can't leave until the police come. I said, I'm not leaving. Call him. So I'm out in the street with one of these kids, one of these street kids, who scared this bloke by whispering in his ear. It's an old Sicilian trick. When Sicilians whisper, get the fuck out of there quick. Because it's dangerous. Okay? Never mess with a Sicilian that's whispering. So I taught this whispering trick to this kid. So he whispered to this owner of this club. And the club owner got scared and he called the coppers. The police. So I'm standing out in the street and this policeman comes up to me and says, What's your name? You know? Who are you? And I didn't answer. So he goes, Who are you? And then I said very quietly, I said, Who are you? And he goes, oh, uh, well, I'm Detective Constable Dix. I said, oh, yeah. And then he went down to the street kid, and he tried to arrest the street kid. But the street kid wouldn't have any of it, because he hadn't actually done anything very much, you know, other than threaten this guy quietly. So the street kid told this cop to fuck off. Piss off. Then the policeman came back to me and said, we're going to put you in the van and arrest you. I said, are you? I didn't flinch. I just looked him in the eye. I said, are you? Then I told him a terrible lie. Sorry, God. And here's what I told him. I whispered to him. I said, excuse me. Don't take this personally, I said. But there's three types of successful people in the world. There are people that are well off. There are people that are rich. And then there's a third type. And that's the people that are stinking fucking rich. Right? I'm in category number three, officer. You can arrest me. I'm not going to resist you. But tomorrow morning at the police station, there is going to be a bevy, an entire crowd of very expensive lawyers asking you what you mean by this. So now the policeman gets scared. And he says, oh, well, these people in the club have got a right to throw you out. I said, I am out. I'm in the street. How much more out do you want me to be? You know? There's no more out than this. And in the end, the police ran away. This guy got scared. He got scared. Because I had the power, he didn't. He pretended to have the power, but he didn't. I had the power. You've got the power. One of the concepts in the infinite self is you are the power. And you're only the power when you believe you're the power. When you can look in the mirror and say, I'm the power. You're the power. You've got the power. It's really uncomfortable sometimes to even say it, isn't it? I've got the power. Try it. Everybody. I've got the power. Yeah, you've got the power. you got it. You are the power. And you do not need anybody's permission. You've got the power. Now, some of you don't know exactly how to use the power. And some of you may not be 100% confident of being able to look a policeman in the eye and say, Chechnya, brother, Chechnya. Have you heard of Chechnya? You know? Or look a policeman in the eye and say, listen, I'm in category three. Stinking fucking rich. What do you want to do about it? We're going to arrest you. You say, fine, no problem, arrest me. But shit, we're going to come on you like a ton of fucking bricks. Try it. You see, we don't think we've got rights. We've got lots of rights. We don't think we have power. We've got loads of power. You have the power to be free. You have the power to live without being manipulated. You have the power to live without being abused. You have the power to live without being terrorized. 
by your husbands, your fathers, your mothers, your wives, your boyfriend, the police state. You have the power to live and earn money and do what you want to do. You have the power to move. You have the power to love. You have the power to invent your own religion. I did. You know, I have a religion called the Church of the Latter-day Stuarts. And I'm Pope in my own church. And I've got one person in my church, me. And I have my own little ceremonies in my own church. And I can give a flying fuck what the other churches say. Not to be disrespectful, but to say, listen, if you want a church with a thousand rules, it's not for me. I've got like three rules, you know? Love myself, love everybody that I meet, and don't pay any fucking taxes. <laughs> and I've got one or two other rules, like I have this religious aversion, this religious, religious thing about anything that's uphill. You know, like for example, I don't like Tibet. Right? I like the Dalai Lama, but I don't like Tibet. Because Tibet's all uphill, you know? There's nothing in Tibet that isn't fucking uphill. There's no downhill in Tibet for some reason. So I don't like going uphill. So for example, I would have a religious aversion to walking up towards that door because it's uphill. I'd rather go that way. It's not uphill. So that's one of my little religious quirks, you know? It's not supposed to be uphill. It's not supposed to be a struggle. And once you realize the powers inside of you, you're free. Once you realize you are the law, you're free. So one of the concepts of the infinite self, I can't remember which one, probably number 10 or number 12, is, hey, my word is law. That doesn't mean that you can confront the system because they may tow you away. But whatever you say becomes true for you. So if you want to look your husband in the eye tonight and say goodbye, that's your law. And fuck it if he doesn't like it. You know? What the fuck? Did you come to keep him happy? Did you sign your name in blood somewhere? Saying, I'm going to keep this asshole happy and wash his socks for the rest of this incarnation? Maybe you did and maybe you didn't. If you're in a situation that's painful, what are you doing it for? You know, like at work or something? It's a painful job, it's boring people, you feel restricted, you can't breathe, it's suffocating, there's a million rules. Fuck off out of there. Be brave. I did a corporate seminar once, and people would say to me, Stu, why don't you do corporate seminars and stuff like that, you know, teach corporations? Well, I tried it once in a place called Portland, Oregon, in the northwest of um, the United States. And this um, company called me up that does, like, timber and stuff, you know? And they said, can we send our employees to your seminar? I said, of course you can. <laughs> and they said... Um, can we get like a group rate? I said, of course you can have a group rate, mate. So they sent about 40 people from the lumber company. And I talked to them a bit about personal freedom and their life and the journey and the infinite self. And the seminar was on a Friday, on a Friday night. On Monday morning, 11 of them quit. <laughs> Out of 40 odd. So it's 42, 11 quit on Monday. And that was the end of my corporate training career. <laughs> I've never been back since. Because I'm the kiss of death for the corporate world. Because everybody suddenly realizes, wow, this is a completely arseholic life. What am I doing here? Why am I doing it? And of course, we're doing it because of fear. We're doing it because if we don't tick-tock along, we think, my God, my world will collapse. We stay in marriages because we think that somehow we're, it's, we're going to be lonely or something terrible is going to happen if we leave. But it's nonsense, isn't it? I mean, if you're heterosexual, you have two and a half billion people to choose from, right? When it comes to romance. And if you're bisexual, there's five billion Five billion people to choose from. There must be somebody out there you like. What? How do you know, brother? You may not have asked them all. And anyway, it's to do with romance and love. It's to do with, it's to do with romance and love. It's to do with the idea that, hey, there isn't any limit here. There's loads of them. There isn't any limit to how you can make money. There's no limit to your spiritual journey. 
There's no limit to how much knowledge you can acquire. And the only limit is you've got to understand you're free. Oh, wow, I'm suddenly free. Wow, that's really cool. Let's go. Ding, ding, bing, bing. Let's go. You come out of TikTok and you make this turn. And in my books, I call it the thousand day climb. And that's because it sort of takes you a thousand days to get from TikTok to here where you start to begin to develop your spirituality. And you take that spirituality and usually you'll do what I did. You're really awkward with it and you're, you're strange. You know, you get on the green slime tofu diet and you want everybody to do it with you, you know? It's like, you know in America, those people that have those head thingies on their head, you know? I don't know if they're Sufis or Sikhs or what they are, but they get up at four o'clock in the morning and they eat a piece of cake because somebody in the 12th century thought that was a good idea, you know? And they're vegetarians and, and they've got all sorts of rules. And there's a lot of them in Santa Fe near where I used to live. And they're always very pale looking and they wear white clothes, completely white all the way, you know? Like they're wrapped in bandages. And they've got this thing that looks like a, a kid's nappy, you know? Americans call them diapers, that's on their head. And they're very pale, these people. They're super pale. And they always work in health food shops. Have you noticed that? They do, they work in health food shops. So they're really, really pale, and you're at the checkout counter, and this sort of white ghost apparition with this nappy on their head gives you some green slime and says, this is what I take for energy. <laughs> and you look at them, and you look at a slime, and you think, shit, you know? I'm out of here, man, you know? You run across the street into the pub and say, listen, give me a treble fucking gimbal down, some vodka, anything you got, man. If that's what these bastards say for energy, I'm out of here, man. It's too scary. Well, that's what happens up here, you see. You start to believe in this shit. So you believe in the, you know, in sort of Rami, Swami, the Bami. And, you know, you don't notice that he's some dusty little fucking Indian up the Hindu Kush who's going, everything is love. Well, I mean... <laughs> It's like, yeah, man, but I mean, what else, you know? Give me the power, give me the knowledge. Oh, no, you don't need any of that. Everything is love. <laughs> Sit here for another 50,000 years. So give me a break, man. But you see, at the beginning, you can't work that stuff out. Not like that. You can't work it out because you haven't got the power to say, listen, this is fucking bullshit. You know, so this is a living God. And you think, ooh, wow, sit here. You know, and the incense is there and they're bonging on the drums. And people are giving it all that good sort of meditation stuff and they're om in their oms. And it's very hard, isn't it? It's almost impossible to look at him and think, who the fuck is this guy? You know? They say, oh no, this is the living God. You say, <laughs> he looks like a bicycle repairman from Karachi to me. <laughs> they say, oh no, 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 excuse me, that's very sacrilegious. You say, no, 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 I've, I've met bicycle repairmen from Karachi. They look exactly like this man. But your brain can't sort of... It can't hack the contradiction, you know? I mean, your brain knows he's a bicycle repairman from Karachi, but it can't accept it. Because it sort of tells you lies, you know? You buy the idea of the fact this is a living God. Well, if he's a living God, what's he actually saying, you know? Or maybe it's a she, you know? What did she say? Well, actually, she didn't say anything. She sat on a pillow for 45 minutes and said, fuck all. You think, fuck, man, I've got relatives like that. They come around and drink my booze and don't say anything. They're bullying me shitless, man. So at the beginning, you can't tell the difference. And that's at the end of the thousand day climb. So you're up there with Swami Rami. Who invented this stage? You've got to keep walking, man. <laughs> you're up here with Swami Rami and you genuinely believe that the green slime thing is going to work for you. And you're convinced that everybody on the whole planet should have it, right? But you haven't really reached the infinite self. You haven't really reached your power. You're still in this intellectual concept, you know? And have you noticed, like, all those books are very thick, aren't they? You know? The secret teachings of Sri Bongo, Dongo, Longo, Spongo. And it's like 40, 100,000 pages long. And you think, what the fuck's this about, you know? Why is it taking so long? Because God, it's a short word, isn't it? It ought to be like maybe one or two pages long and a few little ideas with it. But here you buy the complication because you have to do a lot of thinking. And then you move along here and there's a place here that I call the plane of desolation. That? 
Desolation is where things are very, very sparse. Desolate means the absence of trees. Let's say, for example, a desert would be desolate. Um, you know, the high mountain areas with no trees might be very desolate. Um, having no friends would be desolate. And the reason why this plain is desolate is because it's there where the ego dies. It's there where you start to embrace the infinite self. And you embrace it through quietness, through meditation, through serenity, through touching nature, through realizing that you're a complete arsehole. You know, it took me years to figure that one out. <laughs> years and years and years. I actually thought I knew things, you know. I mean, it must have taken me three to five years to work out I am completely arseholic. I should, you know, join Arseholes Anonymous here, man, you know, and go to meetings every Tuesday. Because I'm a complete fucking idiot. As you travel, you travel towards God, and you go so far away from the TikTok material world, and the ego starts to die. And as the ego starts to die, you start to believe that you're dying. So you'll have all these sort of like near-death traumas. You'll think, my God, I'm falling sick. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to crap out and fall over. And it's just part of this journey. And basically what you're doing is you're moving towards the transcendental self. And the transcendental self is not complicated. It is simple. It is extremely simple. It's even simpler than I'm describing it here. It's just I'm contracted to talk for two hours tonight. So I'm going to complicate it a bit. But I can show it to you in about three minutes. If you come tomorrow, I'm going to show you how to blow a hole through the top of your crown chakra in 4.20 seconds. Ding, ding. People say, ah, oh, the Kundalini, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And you have to push your sperm here and you have to suck here and you have to take it up your spine through the jade portal and the chakra and the dinky lacra and la 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 la. And you've got to sit here and shag in a monastery for 91 years. I can fix the Dunk Kundalini for you in four minutes and 20 seconds. Boom. There it goes. You can see God. You say, it can't be that easy. You say, okay, we'll do it in three minutes and 20 seconds. We'll speed it up if you're in a hurry. You see, we're mad. We're so mad as humans. I mean, you have to have compassion for our stupidity. And what's beautiful about it is we're jointly, collectively stupid. It's not like I'm very clever... You know, and these people are very stupid, and, and she's very clever. You know, we're jointly silly. Totally fucking silly. Now, imagine if you were God. You'd be sitting up there somewhere just pissing yourself laughing, wouldn't you? Thinking, my God, well, look what these people are doing. They're sort of banging into each other like idiots. But to cross and to get there, you have to go through this very quiet, lonely place. Where your world begins to die. Where the people that you're friends with tend to drift away. Where the things that you used to think were really, really important suddenly change. Where you stop seeing yourself as African or Italian or German or Polish refugee, female, male, computer analyst, nurse, doctor, bus driver. And you start to see yourself as an infinite being. Now the beauty of an infinite being is you can move in any direction you like. So when I teach these kids at night, I teach them how to walk. And first thing we do is we practice walking. It's, you think it was obvious how to walk. But I tell him, listen, let's walk down a hallway here, and you've got to own this hallway. So I'll make him take the power from here and hit the roof, boom. And then I'll make him spread the power out, left and right, and walk down this hallway. And they do it. And then I, sometimes I might say, here, do this. I say, walk into this restaurant and silence the whole restaurant. So that everybody in this restaurant stops eating and talking. And you'd say to me, well, Stuart, how do you do that? It's easy. You walk in, you just push your power. Boom. You can stop a meeting. And it's amazing to watch. And I'm not lying to you. I've seen it done. And it's just control. It's just having the power. It's knowing that you are the power. It's not mind. It's not money. It's not materialism. It's not sexual power. It's not physical power, it's not political power, it's not fascist, black uniform, bullshit, crap. It's just energy. And in the end, we're only energy. We're not really a physical body. We're an energy, a subtle body, an etheric energy, a feeling. You can move that feeling anywhere. You can touch a person, bing, and make them look round. 
I take kids, 11 year old, like I have a son that's 11, and I take him and, and his mates out, and I make them sit in cafes, and I say, move this man with your mind, with your feelings, tickle his ear, make him look round. And the kids do it. I say, make these people stop walking down the street. And they do it. And they know at 11, they can touch a person, bing, they can hit them. And the person will go, whoops. We're the power. We're, we're, we're basically a feeling inside a body. What you think of feelings are actually only sensations. So when I tap my hand with this mic, that's a sensation. It goes to my brain, up my, up my arm, in a binary system, zero, one, zero, one, on, off, on, off, that tells my brain, you are whacking your hand with a microphone. <laughs> but that's not a feeling. And then the emotions we feel, pain, joy, hatred, fear, even those aren't actually feelings. They're sensations. Where the feeling occurs is inside the subtle body, not inside your physical body, not inside even your brain. We are basically a feeling. And that feeling is in the etheric. And that's your power. Once you realize that's your power, that's your infinity. And then what can you do with this etheric? You can move it. You can make people see things that aren't there. You can stop them. You can hold them. You can scare them. You can give them joy. You can make... There's a system where you wipe their mind quick and they go into blank for a second or two you can stop them talking you can make them talk you can empower them to become powerful or you can debilitate them to become weak that's the power and every one of you here has this ability and you do not have to be a swami rami barmi on the mountain for 2500 years you can do it quick instant ding ding let's go you just got to believe you can do it that's your power. So I started teaching people, hey, you've got the power, brother. Come with me, sister. I'll show you. You've got the power. You've got the power. And so I'd carry people up that journey. It's hard. It's really hard part of it because the ego dies and you're lost. When it dies, your world kind of dies. But beyond here, there's a doorway. And here at the front of the door, in this area here, it's what's known in English as a singularity. It's a scientific term. And it's basically an area of extreme gravity. It's almost like you're down a hole. It's the same as the area in a black hole in space. And right near the door, it's very hard to get through the door because the singularity stops you. It took me three years to get through. Once you're on the other side, you suddenly realize, wow, we live in a trans-dimensional universe. And it's not hypothetically trans-dimensional. It's right here. It's right in this room. And these other places and these other worlds are right here. And these other dimensions are right here. So then I started to travel on. Ding, ding, let's go. Ding, ding, let's go. But as I traveled on, I had to face my fears all the time. Because the further you go on the journey towards the infinite self, the more frightened you get. There's no cushy ride, you know? There's no cushy ride. So sometimes I'd be out there and I'd see something so scary. You know, like really, really scary. Like this really scary being, let's say, you know. And so I'd run away for a bit. Coward. Well, not a coward, but just a human that was scared, you know. And then I got used to looking at this stuff and saying, Come on, ding, ding. Have you seen The Matrix? You know, eh, hey, come on, you know. So once I started doing, come on, ding, ding, it got so easy. Because these beings would come at me, and I'd go right into their eyes and go, fuck off, boom, boom, let's go. And I'd go to the next one. And then I got into these really, really strange experiences. I mean, totally bizarre experiences. With um, some of the trans-dimensional beings, that, which are referred to popularly as UFOs and greys and reptilians and that sort of stuff. And I've like chased them up the hallway with swords and that sort of stuff. Um, and at first I was victimized enormously by them, you know? And they'd be in my room and at the end of the bed and they'd be giving me a hard time and they'd be making my life difficult, you know? And in the end I went, nee, ding, ding, come on, let's go. You know? And it's the same with your fears. If you look at your fears and you turn and you run, you'll always be, you'll always be scared forever. 
If you look at your fears and you don't turn and run and you go, ding, ding, let's go, your fears melt, you know? If somebody's being tyrannical and they are manipulating your life and they're tormenting you and terrorizing you or they are, you know, manipulating you emotionally or financially, the more you let them do it, the worse it gets, doesn't it? The minute you look at them and say, fuck you, you take the power away. So that was my game. And then I went through that doorway and I just kept going on and on and on and on and on. On and on, thinking, wow, how much fear can I go beyond? So then I kept inventing new experiences for myself that would be even more scary than the last one. And in the end, I've got a feeling your spiritual journey is actually very much a measure of how much fear you can go beyond. Ding, ding, let's go. You know, let's get right in the center of the universe. You know, where all physical form melts and you're left with just the mathematics or the fractal nature of the universe. And let's go through that. Bam, let's go. Let's go through this doorway together and discover what's really out there. And so I kept moving, kept moving, kept moving, kept moving, kept moving, kept moving. And I'm really proud of myself because I'm an expert on terrorizing myself stupid. Real expert. Real expert, you know? And I think, wow, what a life. At least we tried, you know? So now I teach people. I teach kids mostly. Only because older people are harder to teach because they've got a lot of questions, you know? And they're serious. And seriousness, I can't deal with seriousness because I'm not a serious person, you know? But when a person's very serious and they've got the carrot up the arse kind of thing... I can't hack it. I don't know what to say to them, you know. I love them, but I can't handle it, you know. So I like kids because they're not serious, you know. So I like working with them. When I say kids, I mean anybody from about 15 to 35 to me is a kid because I'm, you know, 55 myself, 53. But older people, most of them are too serious. to be, to be. You know, you can't do anything for it. And seriousness is such a disease, isn't it? You know. I mean, it's a terrible disease, seriousness. And there's nothing, you, there's nothing you, you don't know what to do for people that are serious, you know? And in the end, they die of seriousness. It's fatal, you know? And that's why if you go to cemeteries um, where they bury serious people, you will always see carrots growing round the graves, you know? <laughs> and the reason why that's so is because just as before they die, the, their anal sphincter releases, you know? What happened to my drink, hon? Did you get me one? Or is it over there? And the carrots fall out. And that's why you... That's why... Have you noticed that? In cemeteries, there's always carrots there, man. Thank you, sweetie pie. It's seriousness. Seriousness is horrible. And when you think about all the serious people you know, it's scary, isn't it? Well, I find it scary. Maybe you guys are very serious, so you like them, but... I find it very, very upsetting. And one of the things about this whole journey that I realized very early on was if you can't handle your own death, this life will torment you. So in the end, you have to be brave. You know? Death is only serious if you're scared of it. And so one of the things that I taught people early on in the early days, in, in, in the 80s when I first started teaching was, hey, you've got to face your death, brother, sister. You've got to agree to it. And you have to take death with you, you know, wherever you go. And I've been in, in that many scary situations, that many like life and death situations. And every time I get into one, I think, ding, ding, this is it. And then ding, ding, maybe it ain't. But what difference? Because in the end, you have to accept. You know, do you not? There's no point in fighting life, otherwise you're never free. And one of the main concepts of this whole infinite self is, you've got to accept. So in any given situation, one or two things can happen. It either will happen, or it won't happen. Simple, isn't it? You will either drop dead tonight, or you'll still be here tomorrow morning. That's it. You know, either your husband is having an affair, or he's not having an affair. Ding, ding. Either you 
decide to keep him. You know, you take him home, you scrub him down with disinfectant and say, listen, stop that shit. <laughs> or you get shot of him. Either they're going to fire you or they're not going to fire you. Either they're going to pay you or they're not going to pay you. But life is so s- simple when you stop struggling against it. You know, when you just flow along with it. Simple. When there's no more struggle, you're free. You're completely bloody free. It's easy. So I realize, wow, death, no problem. In fact, how many of you can safely say, hand on heart, that you're not dead now? (laughs) I mean, you don't know, do you? You might have dropped dead a long time ago without realizing it. And this is some sort of human echo in your body that keeps you going, you know? (laughs) And we can't actually say that we're alive, can we? I mean, you can't prove it. In fact, you can't even prove that your thoughts are your thoughts. Have you thought about that? How do you know they're your thoughts? You can't prove it. And you know how, like, thoughts jump all the time, you know? Some of the thoughts that you have are definitely not your thought. You know? But you can't actually prove that it's you that's doing the thinking. You think, wait a minute, are you kidding? Oh, well, of course my thoughts are my thoughts. And I'd say to you, well, how can you prove that to yourself? And you can't. So maybe all those things that you're scared of, you're not actually scared of them. And somebody else's. (laughs) Do you think I'm scared shitless of my mother-in-law? Think, oh no, I'm not. That's somebody else's thought. You see, you don't know, do you, really? So I thought about this stuff and I thought, relax. What's the worst that can happen here? The worst that can happen is that this plane smashes into a fucking mountain. Boom. You know? And it's a very egalitarian thing, plane crashes. Yet it's a very equalizing thing. It's a bit like sort of socialism, Danish style. Because when a plane hits a mountain, All the people in coach and business class are automatically upgraded to first class. (laughs) At about 800 kilometers an hour. So you all wind up going to heaven as equals. Except for the ones that stop at the little red traffic light. You have to encourage them to come to heaven. You say, come on, ding, ding, let's go, don't be scared. What's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is you drop dead. That's it. That is the worst that can happen. And there's nobody here in this room, including myself, that can tell you that being alive is better than being dead. You know, maybe being alive sucks. And being dead's really cool. If you've had an out-of-body experience, as I'm sure many of you, if you've been on this path a while, have, the first thing I noticed was how light one is out of the body. You don't weigh anything. And I remember being out of my body the first time ever and looking back at myself and thinking, wow, man, I feel so light. You know, like I feel literally like a feather. And I'm thinking, shit, every morning of my life I have to get up and I have to schlep like 160 pounds, right? Which is what, 75 kilos or 70 something kilos around all day. I mean, already that's very bothersome, isn't it? You know, it's an effort, isn't it? It's like as if God clips this dead horse to your leg every morning. You think, I'm going on my spiritual journey. And I have 180 pounds, 75 kilos of dead horse clipped to my fucking leg, man. But it should be okay. Because all the gurus, have you noticed they're always uphill, aren't they? That's what I don't like about gurus. They're always up a fucking mountain, man. That already pisses me off. I mean, why don't they have gurus in flat places like Holland and Denmark? No, they're always up in Tibet or some shit like that. Anyway, there we go, there we go, there we go. It isn't serious. And when you don't fight it, you begin to realize it may take you 10 years. It certainly took me 10 years. Hey, it ain't serious. What's the worst that can happen? What is the worst that can happen? You know, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is that she's not there tonight when you get home. You know, the wife, the girlfriend, your partner. And you might be sad and you might miss her and you might also think, fucking hell, what a blessing. You know? (laughs) Because all of the things that are missing in life that suddenly disappear is the God force's way of making you lighter, isn't it? 
You know, when things have gone, they seem like such a tragedy. And then a week or two later, you think, my God, I'm so glad. Has that happened to you? It happens to me all the time. You know? And I say in my books, if you, if you, let's say, go home and, you know, the stereo and the CD player and the mini disc and the VCR have all been stolen, you can get upset and you can tear your hair out and you can rant and rave about the injustice of it. Or you say, ah, oh, they came for the TV. <laughs> you know? You don't need a TV anyway. It's bullshit. So what do you need it for? I, mean, I haven't had one for years and years and years until the kids protested so bad that in the end I said, okay, if we've got to have a TV, we'll have it downstairs in the basement where the kids can watch it. But I don't want it in any part of the house where I've got to go watch it. You know, if your husband leaves, it's probably just about right now when you need to get rid of this arsehole, you know? If you get fired from your job, it seems so disastrous, and yet it's liberating you, isn't it? I love to put on forms where it says occupation. I love to put self-unemployed. <laughs> People say, what is self-unemployed? You know? But it's so cool to put that, isn't it? Self-unemployed. To think, what the fuck's that? That's voluntary work, you know? You work when you want to work, and you don't work when you don't want to work. Simple. You know? You study when you want to study, and when you don't want to study, don't study. You come home when you want to come home, and if you don't want to come home for a month or two, post them a letter. <laughs> Go on fishing. Ciao. <laughs> See you later. Would you mind feeding the cat? They say, I'm not feeding your cat for a month or two. You say, okay. I'll cure you some cat food every two days. You see, it could be simple. Because the infinity inside of you is simple. It could be benevolent and kind, because the infinity inside of you is benevolent and kind. It could be uncomplicated, because a God force definitely, categorically, I will give you my personal assurance, is not complicated. And it certainly isn't righteous. And there's no hierarchy. So this business of these holy people that are the living something of God, that is complete crap. If you believe it, I feel sorry for you. But then there are many things that I used to believe that were totally stupid as well. So it's not that I'm better than you, but I just feel sorry for you. Because it's bullshit. You've got the power. You've got the law, because your word is law. You've got the energy. You've got the perception. You just have to believe and work on it. You've got the freedom. The door's there. Ding, ding, let's go. You don't have to be in prison if you don't want to be. It's voluntary. It doesn't look voluntary, but it is. You know? It is. So practice after me. The next time an official comes and asks you and says, you've got to do this and you've got to do that, finger up, fuck off. They said, are you telling me to fuck off? You say, I have, yes. Fuck off. I'm an infinite spirit inside a body. You can't be telling me this shit. And get your snotty little fucking dog out of my luggage. Fuck off. You don't have to do it a lot of times, but you've got to do it a few times to know you can do it. You know? What are you doing? Fuck off. It's got nothing to do with you. What's your name? Piss off. They said they could not have christened you piss off. They did. I'm a Polish refugee. My name's piss off. Fuck off. You see, and once you realize you can push... It's very scary to push, isn't it? You know? It's very scary to push against the manipulation that people put on you. Because in many ways, some people like being victims, you know? But you know when you have those people that like being victims? You kind of sort of want to whack them in the head to keep them happy, don't you? Their victim energy says, please belt me in the head, won't you? Boom! Do this. So you like victimizing them. The minute you're not a victim and you step back and you go, fuck off, they will run away. If they don't run away, you pick up a big piece of wood and you give them a clip in the head. Bang! <laughs> Fuck off now. This club owner the other night, he said to me, I've got friends in the IRA, you know, the Irish Republican Army. And I said to him, have you now, man? And I went, bang! And he went right off this wall, dying, boing, you know? 
I said, don't be telling me about the Irish Republican Army. I said, fuck you, man. I've been going to Ireland for 20 years, man. He says, well, I've got friends in the South London duty duty gang. So I went, bang, again. This time he bong, bong off the bloody wall again. I said, don't be telling me about the duty duty robbers and brothers in South London. Well, this arsehole couldn't get the message. So then he says, we are, well, I'm connected to a Yardy gang in North London and Islington. What a boom, I whack him again. I said, are you getting it now, brother? I could give a flying fuck for you, the IOA, or your Yardy gang. He says, you've hit me three times. I whacked him one more time in the head. Bang, you know. I said, no, man, you can't count. I've hit you four fucking times. I pissed off out of it. And he got scared and he ran away. I mean, I'm not suggesting you do this all the time, okay? <laughs> but once every so often, it's great, you know? So when the mother-in-law comes around with that stupid cake on Sunday, right? Tell her to fuck off, you know? When the minister or the priest at church says, how are you on Sunday? Tell him, piss off, <laughs> you know? When your boss comes in and goes, nye, 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 say fuck off out of it, will you? You know, before I got really pissed off and I whack you in the head with this computer, fuck off. And he says, or she says, to you, what's the matter with you? You say, well, nothing's the matter with me, but I've just been to a Stuart Wilde seminar, so piss off. <laughs> Fuck you and your little dog, too. You know that lovely line from, what was it? Wizard of Oz. And I get you and your little dog, too. Fuck off, man. Be free. Be free. We don't need this shit. Be free. Don't forget, if you see the little green man, don't cross the road. Wait for the red one. We're going to take a 20 minute break. Thank you. <laughs> ding, ding, let's go. Okay. It's a long journey. It's a very long journey. It's a very long journey from the front of the hall to the fucking blackboard as well. But there you go. That's life. Maybe tomorrow we can make a little gap here, you know? Oh, this shit, get out of the fucking way, eh? Make a jump. I'm not a fucking horse, man. Okay. The three, the three steps at the end of the 33 steps of the infinite self, right? I call quest fusion and then the initiate I can't spell it okay and I just talk about these three first even though it seems like I'm doing the end at the beginning but that's how I like huh? you start with a dessert coffee main dish starter soup aperitif okay the quest is the sacredness of this journey and your life has to become sacred Otherwise, it has no meaning. Do you follow me? And how do you make something sacred? Well, there is no way of making anything sacred other than just by concentrating on it and saying this is sacred. So if I had some holy relic from, you know, the church, you know, and I could say, well, this is St. Matilda's toenail or something, okay? It's only a fucking toenail in a box unless you concentrate on it and say this is sacred. Then you can have pilgrims come and pay you God knows how many thousands of pounds just to look at his toenail. But what makes anything sacred is the fact that we concentrate upon it and say this is sacred. There is no other way of making it sacred, okay? And to make your life sacred, you have to concentrate upon your life and make it sacred. So that could be rituals, it could be prayer, meditation, you could light incense, you can put 25 candles and soak in a bath for an hour. You can make love to your husbands, your boyfriends, your girlfriends, and make it sacred. You make everything that you do sacred. So if you're doing the washing up, that can become a sacred act because you're concentrating on it. In fact, love is actually concentration. So when you fall in love, okay, romance. Romance is actually a disease that comes from over-concentrating on another person, <laughs> right? And, but in the end, that's what love is. Love is concentration. It's like putting yourself aside to concentrate upon the needs of somebody else. Putting yourself aside to concentrate upon the needs of humanity. Co putting yourself aside to concentrate upon the pain of humanity and hope to heal them. Putting yourself aside to concentrate upon goodness. Putting yourself aside to concentrate on whatever. So you make 
your life sacred by basically saying this is sacred. You make it important. And then you have to have your own priorities and your own boundaries. So there are certain things that you decide you want to do in your life and you go ahead and you do them. And you don't let people push you and pull you and tug you out of the way. So you say, hey, every morning at 4 a.m. I rise and I meditate. And that's my program, you know? And it doesn't matter if you come home at half as three, drunk as a skunk. Four o'clock, you're going to do the meditation because it's sacred to you. Then there's a morning when you decide, push it to this four o'clock thing. And you throw it out and do something different. But sacredness is just a matter of making your life important and concentrating upon it. So you have to empower yourself and you have to love yourself. This is not an egocentric, egotistical thing necessarily. It's just a matter of saying, wow, if I have the power and I concentrate upon myself, my life will become more powerful. When your life's powerful, you can talk to somebody and you can demand something in a friendly way and they'll give it to you. Ding, ding. I want it. I was in a plane the other day. And um, I don't like biscuits. I don't eat biscuits. But I saw this American cookie. And I hadn't been to America for a long time, so I ate this cookie. And it was delicious. It's like a chocolate chip cookie. And there was this really, really sort of wimpy TikTok nerd sitting next to me who was some kind of architect. And I just turned to him and I said, give me your cookie. <laughs> just like that. That's the exact words. I'm not exaggerating. Give me your cookie. And he sort of went, well, didn't you get a cookie? I said, yep, I got a cookie and I ate it. Now give me your cookie. <laughs> it was the most fun I've ever had. Because he went through this unbelievable trauma of shall I, shan't I, will I, want I. And, he, and, he, and suddenly he really desperately wanted his own cookie. And he picked it up, he put it down, he picked it up, he put it down. He opened it a little bit, put it down, opened it a little bit more, you know. And I knew in the end that he couldn't hack giving me the cookie. So then he started eating it like one, two little tiny bites, you know. So I nudged him again, you know. I said, see the guy across the aisle? Tell him I want his cookie. And this guy had gone, ah, ah, ah. I said, just tell him. Say, this man here wants your cookie. <laughs> I was only playing a game. But I thought, wow, why you get the cookie, man, you know. It's like life. You go into the, to the boss tomorrow and you say, listen. When I first signed up on this job, I was weak and insecure. And when you asked me how much I wanted, I couldn't value myself. You know? So I only asked you for a few thousand kroners a week. I want a hundred grand. Fuck you and your little dog too. Give me the money. I believe in myself now. My life's sacred. And if your boss can't see you at a hundred thousand, tell him, okay, ding, ding, ciao. Because sometimes the easiest way to get a big pay rise is to move to another company, isn't it? Because they don't know what an arsehole you are yet, you know? <laughs> and plus, if you came in at like 15,000 kroner a month or something, you know? Sometimes it's very hard for people to see you at 100,000 kroner a month because they're sort of used to you being a suffering servant, do you follow me? So sometimes you have to quit one job and move in at a higher level. But the point about Quest is, it's sacred, this journey. And you only have a small amount of time not that there's a rush, but we only have a certain amount of time. And every one of us here have wasted 10, 20, 30 years. You know, when we signed up for Arseholics Anonymous, we wasted a lot of time, you know. So make it sacred. Make your sexuality sacred. Make your life sacred. Make your money sacred. Make your spirituality sacred. Make it all sacred. And as you get disciplined... And as you begin to center and control the mind, which is a central part of how you grab this infinite self and how you actually see these other worlds, then eventually the next step is fusion. And fusion is that moment when it all comes together. You know, almost like a welder with some metal and he has this hot lamp and he can fuse two pieces of pipe together and make them whole. And it's really the fusion between the yin and the yang inside of you. Each one of us is androgynous and androgynous means sexless. So you're not really female or male. You are an eternal spirit that has no sexuality. It's androgynous. And in the fusion, you get to that androgynous state. You know, you get to this infinite state where you actually join with God. And joining with God is not a holy moly spiritual bullshit. It's just joining the humanity. You know, being able to look at total strangers and say, I love you. Try doing it tomorrow at the traffic light. I love you. Huh? 
What are you, some kind of poof? You say no. I just love you, brother. What do you want? I don't actually want anything. I just love you. You know? The fusion inside of yourself is the joining of the yin and the yang. It's a joining of the feelings. It's a joining. It's a point where the mentality becomes settled. It's the point where you learn to accept. And one of the steps in the Infinite Self book is acceptance. It's like, don't fight. Accept. Don't resist. Accept. If today is your last day, accept. And it only becomes sad if you haven't done anything with your life. But if you've done something, if you've traveled, if you've seen, if you've been, if you've helped people, if you've experienced, if you've loved and you've lived, and you've listened to the great operas, and you've seen the great paintings, and you've been to the theater, and you've been to the races, and you've been to Cannes, and you shagged your fucking brains out for weeks down there with a the toy boy, and you've done something, then if today's your last day, what the fuck? You had a good time, didn't you? In English, we say, I had a good run for my money. Meaning, you know, like when the horses run well, you bet on it. Even if it comes second, at least you had a good run for your money. You know, at least, you know, you entertained yourself. That's fusion. Fusion is where you consolidate inside yourself. Where you go beyond having to explain yourself. Where you go beyond the guilt. Where you go beyond the pain of your dysfunctions. You know, some of you that were abused as childhood. It's sad. It's part of your karma. But get over it, ducky. You know? You can't stay abused forever. You people say, well, I was so poorly treated and we were so poor and stuff. Hey, okay, so that was your karma, you know? Fusion says, you're rich. You're not only materially rich, but you're spiritually rich. If you, rich, if you can open your heart. Most people have a heart chakra like a flea's arsehole. It's about <laughs> this big. You know, why? Because to open your heart means you have to become fearless. And you know what I was saying to you? Most of my journey in this life has been how much fear could I hack? How much fear could I take? How brave could I become? In the end, bravery is your only option. I say it twice. Bravery is your only option. Because otherwise you're perpetually a victim of your fears. And you're not only a victim of your own fears, but you're a victim of all the fears that people place upon you. You know, they say, oh, you must be careful of this, and you must be careful of that, and you don't do this, and don't try that, and what if you lose your money, and what if you do this, and what if they run away, and what, you know? Fuck that shit. Be brave. So when you look in the bathroom mirror tomorrow, and you're putting your makeup on, or you're having a shave, or you're doing both, <laughs> just tell yourself, bravery is my only option. It's the only option I got. And sometimes I take people out on really, really, really spooky journeys. I have these tours called transcendental tours. You cannot describe them. <laughs> They're more transcendental than most, than most people can hack, you know? It's a lot of transcendence very quick. And some of them are very joyous. They're very entertaining. And we go out at night and we have a heaps of good fun, but some of it's really scary, you know? And it's scary for me as well. You know, and I tell them, we're going out today and we're going to be shit scared all day. Bravery is the only option. Let's go. Ding, ding. And that's your fusion. That's the point where you don't have to explain yourself anymore. In the older days when we used to do the Warriors Wisdom seminars and they kind of became a little bit of legends really because they were so strange. In the early days, they used to make people dress up in funny outfits. In the end, I dropped the idea because it was too complicated. But I'd make people like, let's say, for example, hire a chicken outfit. Okay? And let's say you work in a bank. So you hire a chicken outfit. And on Monday, you go to work in a chicken outfit. <laughs> at the bank. Right? And you're not allowed to explain yourself. You just arrive at the window and you start cashing people's checks, answering their inquiries, transferring their money, you know? And when they say, why are you wearing a chicken outfit? You say, what chicken outfit? <laughs> in other words, you don't bother to explain yourself. And I had three guys in one of the seminars that were part of a commando military unit in Australia. <laughs> and they were part of a company, Commandos, and it's a very famous unit in Australia, in the Australian regiments, uh, military regiments. They went to the camp 
dressed in ballerina outfits <laughs> with tutus and tights and the whole bit. Now, these are military men with huge muscles and tattoos, killers, been to Vietnam, blah, 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 all that bullshit, you know? And they just went back to the military camp dressed as ballerinas. And the sergeant, you know, the, the guard of the gate at the camp saluted them. Fucking amazing, huh? And they just walked in in their ballerina outfits. They didn't explain themselves. It's really hard to do if you're a military man. Any soldiers here in the room? Try it. You know, just to arrive, you know? Try walking backwards for half an hour. Down the street, backwards. Just keep walking backwards. And don't explain why you're walking backwards. You know? Or take your dog and dye it pink. You know, and go to the office with his pink dog. People say, why is your poodle pink? You said, I don't know, it must be something it ate. You know? <laughs> the point is, it's the fusion is, you cannot actually heal all of the pain of your life. Do you see? It's sad, but you can't. All you can do is have enough energy to go beyond the pain. You can't heal all of your inadequacies. I can't heal mine. You know, I'm seriously dysfunctional. I'm proud of it. I have a PhD cum laude in dysfunction. But I'm not trying to heal my dysfunctions. If I ever woke up one morning without my dysfunctions, I'd totally feel fucking lost, you know? I'd say, what is the matter with my life? I feel okay. You know, I'm, I can't heal my dysfunctions and I don't want to heal them. I like my dysfunctions. You can't get past your fears, all of them. So just agree to be scared. Just be human. People say, what's the matter with you? So I'm completely scared shitless. Love me, God, I'm scared. You know, I remember lying in bed three nights ago, I had this really spooky experience. I was just lying there saying, love me, God, I'm scared. Love me. That's it. That's all you can say, you know? That's fusion. The fusion is when you know you've done your best, you know that you have compassion and benevolence for humanity, you know that your power can heal people, and you will never be perfect. You'll never be the perfect mother, you'll never be the perfect father, you'll never be the perfect employee, you'll never be the perfect boss, you'll never be the perfect professor, the perfect airline pilot, you know? Maybe you will smash them into the mountain, you know, boom, all 350 of them, you know? And when you're all in the out-of-body state hovering around a plane crash, you can just say, look, I'm awfully sorry, love me. I put my foot on the wrong pedal. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a big mistake, but ding, ding, what can you do? And once you realize that, you become so free. Do you see how liberating this would be, how your life would become so liberated? You'd have so much energy. Because one, you wouldn't be judging yourself. And two, you wouldn't be working hard to become perfect. You can just embrace the infinite self, and the infinite self is not perfect. It has the potential to be God, because it is God. But it isn't perfect where we are, later maybe, you know? Ten trillion incarnations from now, you know? Maybe we're really strutting around really arrogantly perfect, you know? But in the meantime, we're just a bunch of fuckwits. Let's do the best we can, you know? And so the fusion comes in that moment when you can sit and relax. So first, you see, you can sit and relax a long time before you have the power because you can become complacent in a tick-tocky little place and say, this is it, you know? But it isn't really it, is it, you know? But once you reach that quintessence we use in English, it's a difficult word perhaps, but when you reach that peak of power in yourself, then hey, the power keeps coming, the power keeps moving, and you relax. And if people don't like it, there's not much you can really do, is there, you know? Because you didn't really come to please people. You know, God didn't say, listen, go down to earth and please people. You know, some people will be thrilled to meet you, and other people will throw up. You know? Just, bleh, bleh, you know? Some people will love you. Some people will be frightened. Some people will like you. Some people will think you're a complete idiot. So what? You know, you can't be perfect, you know? So whatever bitterness, let it go. Whatever wars you've had to fight in your life, let them go. Whatever arguments, let it go. Let it go. Just get over it. 
You know, get over it. I'm going to talk tomorrow about the shadow, you know, that dark part of ourself, you know. Can't talk about it tonight because it takes a bit too long because there's a lot of shit in there. But <laughs> you got to get past it all. And that for me was the hardest part, was the consolidation where I had to make myself right, especially as I'm so different to all the people in my industry, you know. He's very dangerous. And <laughs> it's like I suddenly thought, wait a minute, can I be a spiritual teacher you know, and get up there and say, listen, fuck you and your little dog too. And I thought, of course I can. Because one or two things is going to happen. They're either going to hate it or they won't. You know, can I have a vodka and tonic on stage if I want? Yes, I can. Why? Because where does it say you can't have a drink if you don't want, you know, if you want a drink, have one. You know? Sometimes, not very often, I like to smoke a cigarette on stage. Especially where they, we're at very uptight places, like the sort of whole life expo in Atlanta in America. Where, you know, Americans have this carrot up their ass. Serious, man, you know? I love to light a cigarette, you know? In a New Age conference, right next to the no smoking sign, you know? <laughs> to practice. You know, it's like wearing a chicken outfit, you know? If you haven't got a chicken outfit, rent one. You know, rent a chicken outfit. And don't explain to anybody why. You're dressed as a chicken. And that's a way of saying, hey, we're dressed as chickens all the time, aren't we? You know, we really are. You can't see the chicken outfit, literally, physically, but we're dressed as chickens. Look them in the eye and be calm about it. You know, when a policeman says, who are you? Say, who the fuck are you? You know, that's believing in yourself, isn't it? Most people will be all, ooh, sorry, sorry. Fuck off, who are you? You know, little dog comes and sniffs the luggage, fuck off, boom. Do you believe in yourself? You just believe in yourself. And then if people are abusing you, you have to draw a line, a boundary. Then you have to be good at telling people, listen, I love you and there are certain things I won't accept, you know? I will not accept you abusing me, you know? I will not accept you having sex with other men, let's say, because that's your, you, don't, you want the person to be faithful. If you want to go have sex with other people, then piss off. You know, I'm not a, I will not accept you spending my money and not giving it back to me. I will not accept you using my car and not bringing it back, or whatever your boundaries are. But you can have any boundary you like, as long as you just tell people what your boundary is. They're not clairvoyant necessarily, so they don't necessarily know what you want and you don't want. But you just tell them, hey, I've just done a bit of fusion. Fuck off and stop taking my money. And once you get to there, you're free. You see, and most people think this journey is complicated. It's not complicated. It's unbelievably simple. All you've got to do is stop thinking. And we all think way too much, you know? It's what I call in my books, overthinking on life. There's no such real term in English. But it's like, you know, where you're churning your mind, you know? Don't think, drink. It's simple, <laughs> you know? It's so much simpler, you know? So tomorrow morning, if your brain's going like that, have like half a pint of vodka before you start the day. You'll soon stop thinking if you drink enough, you know? You won't give a shit. You'll be so relaxed. I mean, you may not make it to the office on time, but hey, that, uh, you didn't come to be perfect anyway. You tell them, listen, I've got the flu. <laughs> it's so much simpler. You know, it is so much simpler. And I think if I have parted one piece of knowledge to people over the, the long time that I've been lecturing, is, hey, you're beautiful. You're gorgeous. You're much more gorgeous than you think you are. You're much more beautiful than you think you are. You're heaps, heaps more spiritual than you think you are. Because spirituality is your natural benevolence, your compassion, your humanity. That's it. Spirituality is where you help people, you're kind to people, you advise people. That's spirituality. Sometimes being a complete idiot is spirituality. Because people can look at you and think, wow, look at her, she's crossing her traffic lights when she's not supposed to. So you're offering them a lesson, aren't you? You know how to go, up yours. So it's such a simple journey, really, and yet we make it so complicated. And so I came to see, like, wow, fusion, simple. And then beyond fusion is this other world, many other worlds. You know, where you do arrive in the world of the initiate. And in that world of the initiate, you're still human, you're still physical, you still have to tend to your body and feed it and look after it and wash it and clean it and so on. But you are... You are straddled, you know, you're across two or three more different worlds, you know, you're in this other world, and then your perception becomes so acute. 
really fast. You can read people's minds. You can watch them thinking. You can move your etheric left, right, you know. I have a band of female wizards that travel with me sometimes. And you want to see them go. You want to see how fast they are. They are so fast. They can jump in your mind and come out in two seconds. They can read it. They're fast. And you cannot even tell they're doing it. They're so quick. They are so quick. And these are very elegant, very well-dressed, often well-educated, ordinary women that just went through the doorway with me. I mean, it's taken them many years. They didn't do it in 15 minutes, but they did it. And they're fast. They're really fast. Because they got the power. And have they got the power because they were blessed with it or something, or the angel Gabriel descended on their head at some point? You know, when they were 16? No. They got the power because at some point, somewhere, they met this completely arseholic Englishman, half Italian, African, white man, who said, you got the power. And they believed me. You know? And little by little, they figured out, yeah, wow, I've got the power. And they got the power, I'm telling you, they were really strong. Really strong. They're not just strong women, you know, in a masculine world. They've, they're quick. They're really fast with their perceptions. And that's part of the journey, awareness. You know, and then awareness, with awareness comes responsibility. But that's another, that's another discussion about what you're going to do with the awareness that you have, you know. And what are you going to do with all of this power? But first, you've got to get it then what you're going to do with it afterwards is up to you, you know? We chase after Nazis. <laughs> That's what we do with our power, you know? We chase after people that are tyrants. And um, the women will chase after somebody. And they'll check into the same hotel, let's say. And then the five of them will come out, out of body. And they'll fry them and come back in again. All in a matter of minutes. Bing, bing. And that's how they chase after him. And they try to turn evil people into better people. And you might say, well, that's slightly infringing, isn't it? And I'd say, yep, it's very infringing. But there you go. There's a war on. Ding, ding. Because we're living in a world that is becoming more and more fascist every day. You know, techno-fascism, you know? Rules, controls, regulations, silicone chips, credit cards, fingerprints, blah, 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 eye scans. You know, one day they'll bottle your fart and keep it and <laughs> identify you with that, you know? And so we have to push. We've got to stop them doing this stuff because we want to be free. We don't need all this crap, you know? We don't need it. We just need to be free. Okay, yeah, we have to have some laws because you can't have everybody running amok, you know? Or you can't have everybody deciding which side they're on the road they want to drive on. You know, we've got to have an agreement. We're going to drive on this side or that side. You know, but other than that, we don't need a lot of laws, you know, because most citizens are law-abiding, they're kind, they work hard, they're happy to help other citizens, you know, and sometimes they freak out, you know. So we've got to handle them when they freak out. We've got to cure them or look after them or build some psychiatric institutions that will help them or heal their pain or whatever. But, I mean, in the end, our societies are very orderly. You know, we don't need all this fascism, you know? So my particular game in this lifetime is, you know, using the power to liberate people and to stop the fascism, basically, as much as I can. And now, after 15 years, I've got people everywhere. Everywhere. And all of them were like fringe dwellers and you know, lost souls and deadbeats and broke, you know? And now many of them multi-zillionaires, very powerful people, and they're in the top of the big churches and the top of the big corporations and the top of the big TV stations and the top of the film companies, and they're all in there, and they're fixing it. And that's, in the end, is our responsibility, to fix our brothers and sisters, because if we don't fix them, who will, you know? So anyway, you all have a responsibility if you develop your power to get in there and fix them up. It takes dedication. It takes energy. It takes that sense of wanting to help people, you know? I don't mean just giving them money, because giving people money doesn't fix it for them. It just holds them up. 
and helps them be more arseholic, you know? But if you actually help with their pain, if you actually give them back their power, you can help them enormously, you know? And it takes silence, it takes discipline, it takes power, it takes dedication, sometimes it's dangerous. And then in the end, if we don't pull ourselves up, who will, you know? We need everybody to work on this project of giving people awareness and pulling them up. And it does take dedication, you know? I'm going to finish in about five minutes' time, ten minutes' time, because I've got to be out of here by ten o'clock and I've got to sign some books. But before I do finish, I want to tell you a story about a guy who really, really impacted me in this lifetime. And he had silent power like you wouldn't believe. And I was working on a project, and this guy showed up. It was a construction project. And he came along and he said, I'd like to build a Japanese garden here on this building site. And we said, well, we, we have no money to build a Japanese garden, you know, and we don't need a batch Japanese garden. And he said, no problem, I'll build it anyway. So we said, okay, build the Japanese garden. So he started building this garden, and his dedication was that while he built this garden, he wouldn't eat. Just wouldn't eat. So every day he'd come to work at 7 o'clock, and this was in California, and he'd be moving these amazing logs of wood, just walking with them. I mean, unbelievable weights. And he'd take them and he'd dig a hole all day just to put one log in the ground. Then he'd move rock. Then he'd move trees. And he'd work all day. And at night, he had this little harp, this little um, Jew's harp, which is that little metal harp that you place against your teeth. And it makes that very strange kind of wanga, 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 wanga noise. And he'd stay in the garden at night. He wouldn't go home. He'd sleep in the garden and he'd play this harp and he would guard his garden. And he'd look at the energies and he'd watch the energies. And then the next day, he'd move logs, dig, move rock, and he never ate. And every day I used to watch this guy work and I couldn't believe that he'd work in the hot sun without eating. Ever, never ate. He did drink, but he didn't eat. He had drank water mostly. And I'd watch him every day and he never talked. He just built this Japanese garden. Just carried on building it. And sometimes at night, I'd go and sit with him, you know, like at 12 o'clock at night, 1 o'clock in the morning. And I'd listen playing him, playing this little harp with his mouth, ding -a -ding -a -ding -a -ding, really haunting. And I'd look at this guy and think, fuck, this is power, man. This is pure power. This guy is so humble and he's so strong, you know. He just carried on building his garden. He built the garden in 42 days without eating. Just build it. And when he built it, it was beautiful. It was an amazing Japanese garden. And nobody helped him, he just built this garden. That's all he did. And as soon as he finished building it, he disappeared. Just left. No, he just left. He just left. He didn't ask for thank you. He didn't ask for, wow, isn't this amazing? He didn't ask, did you like it? Did you not like it? He built this garden, more or less in silence, day and night for 42 days, you know? And then left. And I thought, wow, that's dedication. You know, that's it. That's the power. You know, and it says so in the dial. You know, when your work is finished, leave. And I know when my work is finished on this earth plane, I'm leaving, like within a second. Ding, ding, let's go. And he just built this place. And I learned from that man. I learned more from watching that man than I've had in all the bloody books I've ever read. Because I actually saw at a very young age what silent power really looks like. And then something amazing happened, right? I was walking through an airport, maybe 10 years later, and I saw him walking towards me. And he was with a woman and a small child, and he was carrying a small child, you know? And I was so happy to see this guy. I was so happy. And I called his name, you know. And he looked at me and he smiled, you know. And he just walked up to me and he stopped and he just went like this. And he just bowed. And walked straight past me. Never said another word, you know. And I'd spent so many nights in the garden with him, you know, just sitting with him, you know. And he just stopped. He bowed and went straight on with his family. Never said a thing. And if he talked to me, it would have completely ruined his story for me. Do you know what I mean? It was so cool that he didn't say anything, you know? But I was so emotional. I mean, I love that man more than anybody else. And yet, 
It doesn't bother me in this lifetime if I never speak to him again, you know? Because he had the power. And he knew he had the power. And he didn't have to be grandiose. He didn't have to be flashy. He didn't have to explain it to anybody. He didn't have to explain why wasn't he eating. You know, why do you stay in your garden all night? Why do you play this funny instrument? Why do you do Japanese gardens? You're not even Japanese. He was European. He didn't explain himself. Didn't ask for any money. Didn't ask for anything. And the day he finished, he left. Didn't ask for thanks. Just wasn't there anymore. Ding, ding. And that guy taught me. He taught me what this journey is all about. You know? And each one of you has a Japanese garden somewhere to go build, you know? Build it. And when you finish, leave. Thank you. I'm going to take a couple of minutes break and then I'm going to sign your books. I'll see some of you tomorrow. Ciao. Good night.